Hello and welcome to my presentation on diffraction gratings, which goes on to explore some aspects of X-ray diffraction with some mentions of urgent research that's going on to understand the COVID-19 virus. I've also included some important questions for you to try to uh, do as you go along. You might also be interested in checking out my PES physics postings. Please do contact me if you're interested in private tuition. A typical transmission diffraction grading used in your lab may have um, 300 or so slits per millimeter. Of course, we can't see individual slits. But when we look at a white light source, perhaps a, a ray box bulb through the diffraction grating, we see a bright white central image with spectra arranged symmetrically either side. We see the first order, second order spectra and so on. But there are limits to the number of spectra we can see, as we'll investigate in a moment. For each order, we say n equals 1 for the first order, n equals 2 for the second order, and so on. But notice uh, that red light in each spectra is deviated through the largest angle and violet through the smallest angle. And from the diagram, I see a little i, which could stand for indigo, but does indigo actually exist? And here is one of my diffraction gratings on the left to give you an indication of size, but diffraction gratings used in scientific instruments are usually much smaller. This is diff transmission grating. Light is transmitted through it, but we do get reflect reflection gratings as well. Ultraviolet light, for example, wouldn't get through a glass diffraction grating of the sort that is on the left. Um, but we could detect it from a reflection grating. Along any radius on a CD, we have tracks, tracks that are a fixed distance apart, like our transmission grating. And so we see the colours of the rainbow. You can make your own spectrometer using a CD and a cereal box or a paper tube. Give it a go. It's lots of fun. When we look at a neon discharge lamp through a handheld spectroscope, or indeed a spectrometer, in a darkened lab, we see a characteristic pattern of spectral lines. Each element, of course, has its own particular set of spectral lines. So what is a spectroscope? Well, one type of spectroscope simply consists of a diffraction grating, a small diffraction grating with a narrow slit at one end of a tube and an eyepiece at the other. And so essentially a spectroscope or a spectrometer contains a diffraction grating, which enables us to measure the wavelength of any spectral line present in the line spectrum, or indeed the wavelength of all lines, which is information astronomers would use to identify the, the elements present in a star. Now, if we look at this quick question, we have, a diffraction grating which has 400 lines in one millimeter so one line in one four hundredth of a millimeter and that should lead you on to deriving an answer in millimeters and indeed in meters this distance is known as the grating spacing and is also the distance between adjacent slits pause the video for a moment and do the calculation yourself. Now, from the diagram here, we can see D on the left-hand side, which is indeed the grating spacing, the distance between adjacent slits. We see light waves diffracting and spreading out from each slit. And let's suppose we have red light of a particular wavelength lambda. At a certain angle of deviation, theta, the waves from each slit will be out of step with its neighbour by exactly one whole wavelength. And that's what we've tried to show in the diagram here. This means that at this particular angle, we will have constructive interference. Your eye will then collect up the waves and add them up to give a bright line, bright red light, 
at this particular angle. Other wavelengths will not add up at this angle. However, they will add up at some other angle, which again depends on their wavelength. Now, I want you to look at the small pink triangle, which fits into the top left-hand part of the main diagram, because that leads in to what we're going to look at on the next slide. One side is D, the other side is lambda. And we've got an angle theta in there, which is the same angle as the angle theta, which is the angle of deviation. So let's move on. Looking at that small pink triangle, one side is D, as we said, which is the distance between two adjacent slits, the grating spacing. One side is lambda because the waves we said are out of step by one whole wavelength. And one of the angles is, is theta. So a little bit of simple trig tells us that sine theta from that little triangle equals lambda over D, or lambda equals D sine theta. For the second order spectrum, the waves will be out of step by not lambda, but two lambda. In that case, two lambda equals D sine theta. In general, n lambda equals d sine theta, where n is an integer called, as we said before, the diffraction order. Now this equation is very significant and should be given in your data booklet, but very important. There is a limit to the number of diffraction orders that can be observed for any one wavelength. This is because sine theta cannot be greater than one, which will explore in some questions shortly. And here are some questions, question two with uh, four parts, A, B, C and D. And the last part asks you to determine what's the highest diffraction order possible with this light and with this particular grating. So think about the maximum value for sine theta being equal to one. Now, um, have a go at this question, which will reinforce the theory that we've just looked at, and you can find answers to this right at the end of this presentation. So, pause and have a go at these questions. Now, this leads us on to an experiment to determine the wavelength of visible light using a diffraction grating. And this is quite a simple setup. We have two half meter rulers. We have you looking through the diffraction grating at a distant ray box. And we've got two half meter rulers lined up, as you can see on the lab bench. If you move a thin pencil or a thin piece of dowel along the ruler, uh, do it so until it appears to coincide with the red part of the first order spectrum. Um, you might find it more helpful to have uh, a friend to do this movement of the dowel or the pencil uh, for you. We can measure x and h and calculate sine theta because sine theta opposite over hypotenuse that would give us sine theta. Now. You could also find theta knowing the opposite side of that triangle, x, and the adjacent side, which is 0.5 meters. However, you then calculate the grating spacing from the number of lines per millimeter on your diffraction grating, so you can then calculate the wavelength for red light from lambda equals d sine theta. You can do this for other orders and then find an average value for the wavelength, because of course in physics we do like average values, and that can lead on to um, estimating uncertainties in our measurement. You can do this for violet light as well, or blue light. Now there are two numbers that I get my students to memorize. 400 nanometers, which would be uh, the wavelength of blue light, and 700 nanometers would be at the red end of the visible spectrum. So 400 nanometers and 700 nanometers, two useful numbers to Remember. Now, here I've got some extra questions. 
uh, one to three, and indeed four to seven. Pause, give these a go, and again, they should help you to um, reinforce your, your grip on the theory that we've been looking at. Now, here I am shining a red laser at a diffraction grating, which has vertical slits. We see a horizontal line of diffraction spots on the screen. The central one appears to be, although it's a bit difficult to see here, the central one appears to be a little bit brighter. You can then turn the diffraction grating through 90 degrees and the line of spots would be vertical. And this leads us on to having two diffraction gratings at right angles to each other is what we call crossed diffraction gratings. And with the same laser, we see a two dimensional grid of diffraction spots. Incidentally, it's quite fun if you direct your laser at a carefully at a mesh of fabrics such as chiffon, notice the pronunciation there, you might be able to see a similar diffraction pattern of spots of laser light. And in principle, it's possible to work back from the distribution angle of the spots and from their intensity, the brightness, to deduce the original pattern of the grid or cross diffraction gratings. Now, X-ray crystallography um, is a very important technique. Laser light will not penetrate a solid crystal sample. Of course, crystals like diffraction gratings have regular spacings, but X-rays can penetrate the crystal lattice, the crystal structure, and leave a diffraction pattern on a photographic plate or film. And in the following uh, decades, following um, 1934, which is a significant date, as I've indicated on my slide, the structure of many other complex protein molecules was uh, described, was determined, using this technique of x-ray diffraction and some of the early pioneers try and find out a little bit more about them a bit of background information for you one of them is max von laue and the other two w h bragg and his son w l bragg so what do we have here we have a sodium chloride crystal we can think of it as being a bit like a very tiny set of cross diffraction gratings. These are regular, there are regular spaces between the layers, horizontally and indeed vertically. But actually, the crystal is a bit more complicated than our cross diffraction grating that we use with laser light because we have regular layers at other than the vertical and the horizontal. And of course, the sodium, atom, sodium atoms are smaller than the chlorine atoms. And here we see a diagram which shows an x-ray beam hitting a single crystal specimen and giving rise to an x-ray diffraction pattern with a set of spots which can be detected on a photographic plate or photographic film. Well, this is all technology. The obvious disadvantage here is that you need to go away and develop the film. When I was a lad, I would take a film from my camera and take it to Boots the chemist who would develop the film, producing negatives, which would then be printed to give my photos. But who does that now? Rosalind Franklin took this and other X-ray photos, which eventually revealed the double helix structure of DNA, an amazing discovery. Famously, Watson and Crick were awarded the Nobel Prize for identifying the structure of DNA, but Rosalind Franklin was left off the Nobel citations. Was this perhaps an example of sexism? Now, X-ray diffraction has been used to determine the structure of many biological molecules, as I said earlier, and indeed the active sites of molecules where certain therapeutic drugs attach to or bind onto. Nowadays, the screen is not x-ray, uh, is not photographic plate, sorry, or, or photographic film, 
but the screen is an array of pixels similar to those in a CCD screen that we will be familiar with from mobile phones, but sensitive to x-rays, of course. These pixel array detectors give faster results, much faster results than uh, photographic plates or film. And it's become much easier to use PAD devices along with computers to work backwards from the strength or intensity and the distribution or pattern of the x-ray signals or x-ray spots if you like to determine the actual molecular structure using a technique called Fourier transformation. Uh, you, you may if you investigate this further come across uh, the concept of Fourier transforms. Nowadays synchrotrons are used to produce a beam of x-rays with a fairly narrow range of wavelengths. Um, the key protease enzyme produced by uh, COVID-19 was imaged in early February of this year by a team from Shanghai using data from the Shanghai synchrotron radiation facility and this identification will almost certainly eventually help with the development of vaccines against COVID-19. Incidentally, proteins such as protease enzymes are sensitive to damage by x-rays, uh, particularly intense beams of x-rays, but the damage can apparently be reduced by cryogenic, by, my apologies, by cryogenic cooling in liquid nitrogen, because x-rays energetically can pack quite a punch. This is the diamond light source at Harwell near Didcot in Oxfordshire and it's the UK national synchrotron and as you can see it covers quite a large area, quite an impressive structure. So what happens there? Well electrons are accelerated from an electron gun we have come across the concept of an electron gun in your physics lessons already through three different accelerators. There's the linear accelerator, the booster synchrotron, and finally they're in the main storage ring. And as these electrons travel in a curved orbit, they lose energy. The energy is lost in the form of intense beams of mainly x-rays, there will be some infrared and some ultraviolet, uh, coming off at a, a tangent as you can see in the diagram and the lines coming off show the beam lines where radiation is directed very precisely at samples um, often biological samples but they could be samples related to material science at the samples under investigation now scientists have to be kept well away from the storage ring well away from any of this during operation because of the dangers from exposure to x-rays. At CERN as well, no one can be anywhere near the beam when it's operating because of the dangers from this synchrotron radiation. And indeed there are, uh, as I've already indicated, synchrotrons um, right around the world doing very important research and this shows some research going on or indicates some research going on at Diamond which is to look at where certain chemicals bind to the main protease um, enzyme from the COVID-19 virus. Another useful technique being used in the battle against COVID-19, again involving physics principles, is cryo-electron microscopy, cryo-EM as it's referred to. Now, there's been some very interesting articles about this in the uh, New Scientist recently. A solution containing a particular molecule, a particular biomolecule, an enzyme perhaps, is flash frozen in liquid ethane as a thin film and then imaged under the electron microscope. A team at the University of Texas were able to image the structure of the, uh, the, the spike proteins on the COVID-19 virus using that, this technique and published their results in February of this year. 
Incidentally, one of the advantages of um, cryo EM is that there's no need for the specimen to be crystallized. X-ray diffraction, however, does require molecules of interest to be crystallized, which in some cases has proved very, very challenging, certainly for some of the uh, HIV um, enzymes. This was uh, a, a real, real problem. So this brings me to the end of this presentation. And just before we finish, can I say, remember to have a go at all the questions and to keep working. You'll find answers here, answers to the questions here and here. And stay tuned in to Fez Physics. So thank you very much. And as I said before, Keep working.